Hey y'all, welcome to Sandy's Library. I'm Sandy, yep I'm still here, much to some folks dismay, but anyway, we're back to continue our Blood Ties series. Today, we're going to tell y'all the story of the haunted horse farm. As the story goes, my grandmother's Uncle Johnny Fuller once spent the night at this old farmhouse that was supposed to be haunted, but before we get started, Let's get a little background information on Uncle Johnny. John Fuller was born September 2nd, 1876 in Webster, Winston County, Mississippi. He died June 5th, 1959 in Kansas City, Missouri. He's buried in the RLDS Cemetery in West Washita Parish near Iris, Louisiana. John married Ophelia Gertrude Phillips on February 22nd, 1903 in Howard County, Arkansas. And just as an FYI, Gertrude was my grandfather's older sister. She was born January 6, 1886 in Waldo, Columbia County, Arkansas. She died March 13, 1949 in Louisiana. They were both members of the RLDS Church. John was baptized and confirmed on October 11, 1890 by J.D. Irwin. Gertrude was baptized and confirmed on November 13, 1899 also by J.D. Irwin. Okay, so let's get back to Uncle Johnny's story. And I don't know if when this happened, if it was called the Haunted Horse Farm yet or not. That's just the way the story had evolved by the time I was a kid in the 1960s and 70s. Nevertheless, Sarah's going to tell y'all the story of the night that Uncle Johnny spent at the haunted horse farm. Take it away, Sarah. As the story goes, John Fuller had been invited by the couple who lived on the farm to come spend the night, knowing the house had a reputation for being haunted. It said the house was the, was the scene of a brutal double murder in days gone by. In some versions of the story, John spent the night in the parlor. Others say it was the front room. Either way, during the night, John was awakened by what he thought was a wagon and team of horses coming up the drive. He said he could distinctly hear the chains on the wagon as they were just a ringing. John reported that the wagon stopped in front of the house and then he heard someone open the gate and shortly after that the front door opened. Apparently John raised up to see who was there but saw no one. Yet he heard footsteps walk across the room, through the house, and then out the back door. Now, this next bit is the part that I don't get because he said that strangely enough he was able to drift off back to sleep after this. Yeah, and he probably regretted that too because sometime later he was awakened again to find a woman standing over him. She was holding a kerosene lamp and peering intently at him. Well, naturally, John was startled by the woman, but he wasn't afraid of her as she seemed quite ordinary. So he went back to sleep. You know... Uncle Johnny was a brave soul. Or maybe he was just crazy like his brother-in-law, my great-grandfather Willie. They both had a reputation for frightening their children with scary stories about their ghostly escapades. I mean, why else would he accept an invite to come spend the night in a haunted house? Yep, and John's story ends with the next morning he sees an image of the woman from the night before hanging on the wall. So he inquires about her, saying she had looked in on him during the night. The family reported the woman in the painting was the former owner, who along with her husband had been brutally murdered in the house. <laughs> That's a great story to tell the kids before bed, ain't it? Yep. We know all about this place since you pointed it out every time we went down there. There's the haunted horse farm. Yeah, when I was a kid, everybody knew this place to be the haunted horse farm. The story I'd always heard was that a couple had been robbed and murdered in the house. Some years later, it was turned into a horse farm 
but nobody could ever live in the house because it was so damn haunted. Anyway, around 1970 or so, two of my cousins, James Roy Sanderson and Lemoyne Salisbury, God rest their souls, along with this guy named John Ates, went over to the horse farm one night. Now, you gotta understand, James Roy was about 20 or 21 and had a reputation for not being afraid of anything. So anyway, they didn't go inside the abandoned house, but went up and peered in through the windows. And whatever they saw, it scared the shit out of all of them, and they took off. They never talked about it to anyone, as far as I know. They wouldn't say what they saw, only that they would never go back there again. And in the early 2000s, I asked Lemoyne what he saw, and the only thing he said to me was, I'm not talking about that. So, what do you think they saw? A reenactment of the murders? Maybe one of the ghosts looked at them. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Okay, so, what's the actual history behind this old tale? Y'all know I'm not going to let it go so easily. So, we've done a little digging, and by we, I mean Sarah. So, tell us what you found, Sarah. Okay, look through newspaper archives in Washita Parish, Louisiana, which is where this took place. I found an article in the Monroe Bulletin dated Wednesday, March 12, 1884. The article was on page 2, column 3, and was titled, Murder for Money, the Terrible Fate of John C. Rogers and His Wife, and Her Name Was Elizabeth. We have applied some mild editing for clarity and readability's sake. The article reads as follows. Our usually quiet and well-conducted Paris was greatly shocked on Saturday by the news of the most horrible murder that has ever stained the good name of Washita. John C. Rogers, one of the oldest and most respected of our citizens, lived with his wife in the 7th Ward near Cadeville. Rogers was 73 years of age and his wife nearly as old. The old couple lived alone about a mile from their married daughter, Mrs. James B. Landrum, and about half a mile from the nearest neighbor, Mr. Stuckey. On Saturday morning, Mrs. Landrum went to her parents' house and found both dead and lying in a vast pool of their own blood. Greatly overcome by the shock of this terrible discovery, she returned in an almost unconscious condition to her husband and informed him of the fact. Mr. Landrum collected some of the neighbors and together they returned to the scene of the tragedy where they beheld a spectacle horrible and pathetic beyond description. John Rogers lay across a chair in front of the fireplace with a bullet hole entirely through his head and his skull smashed in by some blunt instrument, supposed to be an axe found in the room. Mrs. Rogers was also laying across a chair near her husband with a bullet hole through her head. The floor was a, a lake of blood, the room was in great disorder, and the bed torn to pieces. The old man's pockets were rifled of their contents, all of which had disappeared except his pocket knife and toothpick which were laying on the mantelpiece. The mattress had evidently been ripped open in search for money, $2,000 of which was hidden in a canvas belt but which the murderers failed to find. Trunks, boxes, and every article that could afford a place of concealment for money were busted open and the contents scattered around. Two horses one a colt recently gelded were missing, and also a man and a woman's saddle. The old man's gun was gone, besides various other articles. The object of the murder was evidently robbery, and it was equally evident that the fiend who committed it was familiar with the locality and the habits of the old people. Just how long they had been dead, no one could say, but circumstances pointed to Thursday night as the time. No one but the guilty parties witnessed the awful deed 
and owing to the lapse of time before its discovery, nothing certain could be premised concerning it. Circumstantial evidence, however, points to two men, Mullican and Clark, as the assassins. These men were seen going towards the Rogers house on Thursday evening. They were the last known to be with the old people. At the time, they were fugitives from justice, having stolen three mules in Lincoln Parish a day or two before. Mullican had been in the employ of Rogers for about six months of last year and had lived in the house as one of the family. Both were known as men of heart and character. On Thursday night, Mr. Stuckey, the nearest neighbor, heard two pistol shots from the direction of the Rogers house. The same night, Mr. Huey Dickerson heard two horses ridden by his house at a rapid gait. Mullican and Clark have both disappeared. The theory is that the men stopped at the house to stay the night. All were sitting around the fire, Mrs. Rogers on one side, next to the chimney, her husband next to her, and the two men on the opposite side. One of the men, on pretense of going to the water bucket, which was behind Mrs. Rogers, passed behind the old man, shooting him in the back of the head, the ball going entirely through and lodging in the mantelpiece beyond. It is supposed that when the old lady turned her face toward the assassin, he shot her. The ball penetrated just below the left eye, passed through, and also lodged in the face of the mantelpiece. Her face was badly powder burned. John Mulligan is described as a man about 33 years old, 5 feet 8 inches, dark hair and whiskers, a rather heavy build. He had a mustache and whiskers when last seen. His speech is rather slow, and he carries a Hoosier appearance. So... We didn't really know what a Hoosier appearance looks like, but the Google says that it's any awkward, unsophisticated person. Seems like back in the day, they liked to think that crooks and criminals were stupid. But anyway, back to Sarah. He comes from Mississippi and had been informed a few days before that a party of men from his old home were in pursuit of him and would kill him on sight for what cause we did not ascertain. John Clark is described as a man about 35 years old, but looking younger, same height as Mullican, stout but not so heavy. Swarthy light hair, no whiskers or mustache, and looks like he will never have any. He's more genteel in appearance than his companion and had on new gray jeans, pants, and light-colored clothes. He is a stranger, a waif, and bears no good reputation. Is supposed to have come here from Texas. Sheriff McGuire is making strenuous effort to apprehend these parties, but with the start they have had, the chase is likely to be a long one. The posse is also in pursuit of them from Lincoln Parish for mule stealing, and as it is led by our friend Jim Huey, he will certainly catch them if they are still within the state. Since writing the above, we have seen a dispatch from Governor McHenry offering a $1,000 reward for the arrest and delivery of the murderers. The Rogers were buried in the backyard of their home where they were murdered. No wonder the place is so damned haunted. So... Of course, we were curious about Mulliken and Clark and whether or not they had gotten away with their crimes. So, we dug a little deeper. Sarah found numerous newspaper articles from all over the state in March, April, and May of 1884. These killings were a huge deal back in the day. So, the governor has already offered a thousand bucks for their capture, and then John and Elizabeth Rogers' son, Paul Rogers arrives from Texas and offers up an additional thousand bucks. And that, my friends, brought people out of the woodwork trying to lay claim to the reward money. Even sheriffs from neighboring states wired Monroe that they had in fact killed Mulliken while he was resisting arrest. 
Other reports came in saying Mullican and Clark were seen in different areas of Louisiana and Texas. It was a big old mess, y'all. But we believe that we're able to piece together what happened and how Mullican hooked up with Clark in the first place. Yeah, not long after Mullican left the Rogers in 1883, it said that he had trouble with a drunken man and had to kill him. So naturally, he left the area. But like so many other killers out there, he returns some months later to the scene of his crime where he finds employment on the Vicksburg, Shreveport, and Pacific Railroad. Mulliken met Clark in January or February of 1884. Both would later state that they'd met while working together. It's unclear if they met while Mulliken was employed by the railroad or if they'd simply met while doing odd jobs for some of the farmers in the area. Nevertheless, however it happened, one day when Mulliken was reading a yellow back book about the James brothers. So Mulliken says to Clark, let's go into that business. Of course, Mulliken claims to have, have been only joking. Nevertheless, Clark says, all right, it's a good bu business. So they go on about their work, and a little while later, Clark tells Mulliken, if you're in earnest, let's commence business at once. Clark tells Mulliken that he had belonged to such a gang back in Texas, so they left work that very day and soon after they stole two mules from Mr. Spinks somewhere in northern Louisiana. They sold Mr. Spinks' mules, then stole more. See, this is what happens when two people with criminalistic tendencies get together. Nothing good ever comes from it. I'd say these guys were making it up as they went along because they decided to split up. Mulliken headed toward Texas and Clark came down the Washita River, stopping above Trenton. And Trenton is basically Old Town West Monroe. So, Mulliken returns to a Washita parish though. We theorized that Clark had sent word to him that Washita parish was as cool as cucumber, and they'd both be safe there, at least until the next time they commit a crime. However it happened, they ended up back together and headed for the Rogers' home. They both blamed each other, but it's most likely that they both knew why they were there. Yeah, these two were real smooth talkers, no matter what the papers say. I mean, they, meaning the papers, basically call these two illiterates just this side of stupid. Their big mistake, though, was leaving a trail of crimes wherever they went. So, yeah, I guess they were stupid. <laughs> Nevertheless, in one of Mulliken's many statements, and all of them different, it should be noted that he said, on the day of the murder, they were heading to Caldwell Parish. Now, while that may have been their ultimate destination, I believe it's most likely that they knew what they were going to do when they dropped in on Old Man Rogers and his wife. And I don't buy their lame-ass stories about how they were looking for work, either. These guys were on the run already for stealing mules, horses, and God knows what else. Anyway, I digress. So, Mulliken claims that Clark was the bad guy here, and that he was just a hostage. And in one of his earliest statements, he described his hostage situation in great detail. And Sarah's going to read that to us. It comes from the Shreveport Times, dated April 1st, 1884, and the article is on page 2. Mr. and Mrs. Rogers were, were sitting before the fire. I was standing at the end door and Clark was sitting by the old man. Clark rose and got a drink of water. The old man was then sitting with his back to Clark, who had his pistol in a scabbard on his left side. He jerked it out and shot the old man, to the best of my knowledge, in the back of the head, and before I could speak, he shot the old lady. I then started outdoors when Clark threw his pistol on me and told me not to move or he would kill me. He then made me walk out ahead of him. When we got out, he stopped and said, Let's get up close to the house. We returned to the side of the house and Clark said, 
The damned old devil has got to the door. Clark then marched me around to the woodpile and got the axe and returned and knocked the old man in the head with it. He was holding his pistol on me all the while. He then walked me out ahead of him, threw the axe under the house, went to the woodpile again, got some splinters, made a torch, and returned and searched the house. He got a bunch of keys out of a little secretary and then went through the trunks. He did not get any money except for what he found in the old man's pocketbook, about $23. He took the old man's gun and had it and two pistols, then went to the kitchen gallery and got saddles and bridles. He told me to take one and go ahead to the lot. When we got to the lot gate, he told me to put the saddle down and made me go in and catch both horses. He made me saddle one horse and then hold them while he saddled his. He then set the gun down by the fence, holding his pistol in his hand, and made me get on one horse. He then got on his horse, picked up the gun, and told me to ride. Man, <clears throat> that guy missed his calling. He should have wrote fiction. I mean, the only truths in his statement are, he and Clark were together, they dropped in on the Rogers, robbed and killed them, and then fled to Wynn Parish. And all the while, he's supposed to be Clark's hostage. <laughs> yeah, okay. Seems though that by the time they get to Natchitoches, he'd forgotten that he was supposed to be a hostage. Mulliken's statement continues with, We went from there to Red River, stopped at Natchitoches, and put our horses up for the night. I bought a pistol there. From Natchitoches, we went through Sabine Parish into Texas. Clark traded the colt for a horse this side of Red River to a man by the name of Sutton, giving $13 to boot. I traded my horse to a man named Smith in Sabine County, Texas. Went through to Henson, Texas, where we took the cars for Terrell. I came back to Marshall, where I was arrested. I was arrested by Jack Rogers, did not offer any resistance. Having heard that Mulliken was an experienced criminal and a crack shot, we asked him as, the, as to the truth of these reports. He replied that this was the first trouble he had been in and did not know anything about flirting handcuffs by the simple twist of the wrist. He said, however, that he was a tolerable shot with any kind of gun, having been considerable of a hunter in his day. Sheriff McGuire informs us that he evinced great fear of being lynched while coming from Arcadia here on the train. Yep, and he had good cause to worry about that. Soon after Mulliken was arrested in Marshall, Clark was taken into custody back in Terrell. The Telegraph Bulletin in Monroe, Louisiana reported on Clark's capture on Wednesday, March 26, 1884, page 3. The article reads, John or Albert Clark, as he is variously known, was captured near Terrell, Kaufman County, Texas, by a posse led by Mr. James G. Healy of Lincoln Parish. He was known to be at a certain house, heavily armed, and prepared for resistance. The ease with which he was taken reflects credit on the address of his captors, they approached the house in the guise of surveyors and asked for a drink of water. A constable with the party followed the woman into the house and found Clark asleep on the bed. He immediately clapped his pistol to Clark's head and ordered him to cross his hands, which Clark did without protest. Okay, so, considering that they knew exactly where to find him, let's say Mulliken threw his good buddy Clark under the bus. So anyway, Mulliken and Clark are both brought back to Monroe, Louisiana, where they were subjects of separate trials. The Times Democrat in New Orleans, Louisiana, reported on their verdicts on Sunday, April 27, 1884, and that article is on page 2, but Sarah's going to read it to us. The trials of Mulliken and Clark for the murders of John C. Rogers and wife terminated today in a verdict of guilty. The jury was out less than two minutes. He and Mulliken were both sentenced by the court this evening. 
In passing sentence, Judge R. W. Richardson said, John Mulliken and John alias Albert Clark, it is my painful duty to pronounce upon each of you the sentence of the law. You have each had a fair and partial trial. All questions of doubt have been considered in your favor. And with promptness, the jury has unanimously found each of you guilty of the crime of murder. The verdict meets my entire approval. The evidence in your case discloses the commission of a most horrid crime and satisfies my mind as I believe it did that of the jury that you conceived a plan of robbery and in the execution of that plan and for the purpose of its condemnation one or both of you deliberately took the life of these old these two old people by shooting them through the head. You went there and partook of their hospitality and the reward they received was being sent hate eternal by your cruel willful act. You fled the country. Horror of your crime aroused the indication, activity, energy of the citizens of this and adjoining parishes. You were pursued, arrested, brought back, and by a singular detail of circumstances, confessions of crime you have brought upon yourselves the awful sentence of death as prescribed by law. The sentence of the court is that at such pain as the governor of the state of Louisiana may fix you be taken from jail by the sheriff of the parish of Washita and hang by the neck until you be dead, dead, dead. And may God have mercy on your souls. So, after their verdicts, Mulliken and Clark make confessions to Reverend W.A. Mason of the Baptist Church and Reverend B.F. White of the Methodist Church. And while they both owned up to their parts in their crimes, each still pointed the finger at the other as being the ringleader. And you know, I'd expect nothing less from men of their character. And one would think this story is over, but no, not quite. I know it seems like justice prevailed and all, but for the citizens of Washtaw Parish, Mulliken and Clark being sentenced to hanging wasn't good enough. And we're just going to let Sarah read to us what was reported in the Telegraph Bulletin in Monroe, Louisiana, dated April 30th, 1884, on page 2. Saturday, Saturday night between 1 and 2 o'clock, a mob variously estimated at 50 to 150 men quietly gathered around the jail and equally as quietly took there from John Mulliken and John alias Albert Clark, the murderers of old man John C. Rogers and his aged wife Elizabeth Rogers, and King Hill charged with the murder of young Nick Milling, and hang them to the two china trees just opposite the old sheriff's office. They obtained the jail keys from Deputy Sheriff Charles Brooks, who slept in the attic of the courthouse. He testifies before the coroner's inquest that about ten minutes to two o'clock, four masked men came to his room and demanded the jail keys, and upon his refusal to give them up, told him that there was no use resolving. They had come for the keys and were going to have them. He then threw the keys out to them. They then went to the jail and took the prisoners out and hanged them as above stated. He watched them through the skylight. They first brought out King Hill. There was, li- there was but little fuss made at the jail, heard only one scream which seemed to have been stopped by a blow. King was hanged to the tree to the left of the door of the sheriff's office. Mulliken and Clark were next brought out and hanged to the tree to the right of the door. The prisoners were all gagged and bound. The mob seemed to have taken every precaution against being surprised or foiled in their attempt. They had all approached to the jail guarded and tussle every preparation to break in the doors of the jail in case they failed to get the keys. A sledgehammer and an ingeniously constructed battering ram were some of the means for forcing an entrance into the jail left behind by the mob. Can you imagine the people in town waking up to find three men hanging in the courthouse courtyard? 
Hey, those were some crazy times with some crazy people. For sure. The crazy factor of the times in some of our family history stories still blows my mind, even after all these years. But anyway, this concludes the true story of the haunted horse farm back in Washita Paris, Louisiana, where I grew up. So we'll be back soon with more tales in our Blood Tie series. We'll see you then. Later, Gators!